thank you guys. Happy New Year. Happy I'm, I'm pretty impressed. The first week of the year, you're out here, you're out of the house, you're like thinking about big questions in life probably, right? Your wellness, what you're going to do next. So uh, we're going to have fun with this talk. And uh, there's a little theme running in with the subtext. The theme is cancer, and uh, which is a villain. And the heroines are us, women, the care providers and the people that are mastering it. This woman is one of the more famous movie actresses named Mabel Norman. And uh, she got famous in a movie called Race for Life. So I thought that was perfect. Uh, and as you know, this is me, OBGYN. The more contemporary way of saying OBGYN is women's health. And that's my daughter, Olivia. It's always good to know. So, start out with a quote. Assumptions are dangerous things to make, and like all dangerous things to make bombs, for instance, or strawberry shortcake. If you make even the tiniest mistake, you can find yourself in terrible trouble. So, thinking about health, it's my intent that we get a few facts so that we're not making even the tiniest mistakes with ourselves. And we're going to talk about cancer in women mostly. It, but what I'm putting up this person, does anybody know who this is? <laughs> yes, because she did not, in fact, die of cancer. She died of one of the most common thing to die of, uh, especially in older age. But she was in the hospital at least 70 times, had at least three different kinds of cancer. And so, uh, you know, her personal life was somewhat more interesting at times than her career life. But it was all interesting, and she's pretty amazing. And uh, there you have it. She died of heart-related complications. So heart-related complications or, or heart disease or heart attack is actually the, the number one killer of, of women in general, which is maybe surprising. Everybody thinks of cancer, but it's not. It's heart disease. But if you took people by different ages, the thing that uh, you're at risk for is different. So young people, the number one thing is accidents. Uh, People in the middle, it is cancer, and the people at the end, it is heart disease. But these people, who you may or may not recognize, all represent some other cause of death. So the big picture, Grace Kelly. So she, yeah, she supposedly had an accident, because she was only like 44 or something, but they think she had a stroke, and strokes in the top five. And then the top right, she is so beautiful, but she's not that hot of an actress, Ava Gardner. She uh, was born on a tobacco farm, smoked, and she died of respiratory complications, emphysema, and pneumonia. And that's in the top five. And then bottom right, very good, Natalie Wood. Yeah. Right, so she actually did have an accident, also under spurious causes. But cancer, like I said, is the leading cause of death in that middle age group, 44 to 65. Green, flus, and what we can do to protect ourselves. Um, these are the top cancers in women. So most people, what do you think of breast, right? Because it's so publicized. But really, the number one cancer, number one numbers of cancers in women is skin. And we'll talk a little bit about skin. Number two is lung. Probably nobody thinks of lung. And then breast and colon. But what kills people from cancer, the most common, or not the most commonly found, but it's lung cancer and ovarian. This beautiful woman did not have either of those. She had another weird cancer, pancreas. So do you recognize her? She's pretty old. Joan Crawford. I know. I'm trying to find interesting photos of them. You are kind of Brigitte. Okay, so we're going to go into the first cancer I want to talk about. And uh, the, part of the reason for showing all the celebrities is because we are all celebrities to somebody, and everything we do is influencing other people. And then actual celebrities whose lives are so open to us, they really have an impact. So when the stars start smoking or when the stars, when it becomes popular to be tan, naked on the beach and tan, the whole country starts doing it. And what you'll see with the statistics of what kind of medical issues we've had over the decades, it does change as we adopt and uh, unadopt certain behaviors that a lot of times are started by these uh, people that we admire. So Bridget Bardot, do you know the top right? 
right? And the, uh, the bottom right is somebody you may not know. Her name is Eva Cassidy. She has one of the most beautiful voices you have never probably heard of. And I put her in because she grew up in a farm in Maryland, was outside all the time, and at 33 died of melanoma. So she had like three or four albums produced after she died. She was so beloved. So skin cancer, that's what they're up there for. There's three types. Uh, melanoma is the nasty one that's pictured there. It's the one that tends to be more deadly. The other two are squamous cell and basal cell. Basal cell is the most common. Neither one of those tend to uh, kill you, but they uh, cause a lot of disfigurement because you have to have them burned or frozen or cut off. And the risk factors for skin cancer, sun damage, smoking, and the one thing that I would advise is getting an annual screen. Most people just think their general doctor is going to pick up on this. Most of the time you hit like 30, 35, all of a sudden whatever you did as a child starts showing up on your skin. And then at 50, a whole nother crop of your life shows up on your skin. With the skin in particular, it's something is different than it used to be. So uh, funny shape, irregular borders, a change in the color, a bigger diameter, or something that's growing over time. You probably recognize the guy. Yeah, Christopher Reeves. So his wife, Dana Reeves, was actually the person who was affected. And then the bottom right is a famous opera singer. Right. You guys are rock stars. They are bringing us to the next cancer, which I wanted to point out Dana Reeves because this is really not fair, but it's the fact she didn't ever smoke, but she got lung cancer and secondhand smoke or smoke that you're exposed to when you're a child is, is as damaging. So this is the number one most fatal cancer, uh, men and women, and it's more common than breast, prostate, and colon combined. It's so one in 16 will be diagnosed. And that increase, 114% increase, that's about the time after all those beautiful screen stars glamorized smoking and before we debunked this whole thing that cigarettes weren't dangerous. Okay, so this, uh, you guys recognize this one. Yes. So there she is smoking, looking, you know, knockout dead. Gorgeous. Uh, so symptoms of lung cancer, cough, chest pain, Shortness of breath, coughing up blood, weight loss, fever, and loss of appetite. Next body part. So the big picture. She's actually a real star. Yes, Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She's an amazing person who's really done a lot for uh, civil rights, women's rights. And Farrah Fawcett, the singer, is Eartha Kitt. So two of them had breast. And Farah had what we're representing with this picture, which is colon. So uh, risk of family history of colon cancer or one of the hereditary cancers or a personal history of a polyp or sometimes other cancers like ovarian or breast, those can increase your risk of colon. It has an age-related risk, kind of goes up over time, then it drops down like in, when you're 80. Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, you're at increased risk. And then there's people who eat a fattier diet, people who smoke, people who are overweight, and people who are not as active. And it's independent. So it's not diet leads to, and diet and sedentary leads to overweight. It's all of those things independent. And that's a picture of the colon. So it's not, uh, you know, there's the esophagus, the stomach, all the small stuff. But the colon is just that part. And she is, yes, breakfast at Tiffany's. Yeah, she's been diagnosed with that. So lifetime risk, so compared to, what did we just do? Lung, which is one in 16, this is one in 20. Still a lot, third most common cause of death, and it's um, kind of silent. So I have a lot of people come into the office and they say, well, nobody has cancer in my family, or I don't want to have that colonoscopy because I don't have any symptoms. It's like, yeah, well, if you have symptoms, you definitely get checked. So change in bowel habits, and I'm going to get really glamorous to talk about that. Less frequent, more frequent, change in caliber, change in consistency, blood or black, weight loss, and being tired. 
if you come in and you get checked, you're in that left-hand side where we're going to find a polyp before it becomes a cancer. If you don't get checked over time, that little polyp will grow. And then it will start maybe having symptoms. But when it's at the stage of a polyp, you're not going to necessarily have any symptoms. The procedure is the thing to do, which is a colonoscopy. So you have your cleansing, and then you go in and have some uh, nice sleep. And somebody puts a camera in that whole length. And as they're backing out, they're looking at every inch of that. And if they see a polyp, they take it out. 20 minutes. If it's negative, you're good for 10 years. So the colonoscopy. Yeah, colonoscopy. So we see it, and we take care of it. And if the polyp's gone, your risk of progression is gone as well. Exams and those imaging studies only do that sigmoid part, which I don't have a pointer, but the, the bottom like curve. So all the rest of the bowel that you're looking at, where all these numbers are, 19, 17, 11, 6, that, all that, so half of it, more than half of it gets missed. Melissa Etheridge, right? And the top right, Gloria Steinem, right on. And then the beautiful Ingrid Bergman. So now we're getting serious. One in eight. The reason why you can think of so many people, including your friends and family probably, is because look how often it shows up, one in eight. But then the next thing, one in 36 chance of dying from it. So that means that we're actually either finding a lot and, and they're not that serious or we're curing them. Either way, that's good. There are lots of types. Uh, so I bring that up because there's lots of parts to the breast. There's a glands, ducts, nipple, fat, skin, all the different things can create a cancer. And when you're talking to your friends and relatives and you think, well, the doctor didn't do that for me, it's because the management of stuff is different for whatever stuff you have. And uh, breast cancer is so common and there's lots of comparing and contrasting of what we're doing uh, and what the doctors are doing all the time in all of these subjects, but this one's really easy to visualize, I think. So the risk factors for this are reproductive history, which means how old you were when you got your period, how old you were when you had your first baby, did you breastfeed, how old were you when you quit having your period, how many pregnancies did you have, did you use birth control pills? Those kind of questions get asked, probably. Uh, weight is a risk factor, smoking again is a risk factor, certain chemicals, uh, lack of exercise, and then this is also very uh, well known to be related to some hereditary syndrome. So a genetic defect we've identified can increase your risk. So we'll get to that in a second. Screening. So again, with all these things like skin cancer, we look at your skin. Colon cancer, we do the colonoscopy. Breast cancer, we do a study trying to look for things earlier than you're going to find it by the time it's a full-on disaster. And the, the typical things are depending on what the symptom is again. If you had a nipple discharge, you're going to do that bottom thing, ductogram. But for most people, the screening test is a mammogram. And sometimes in a young person, an ultrasound. And sometimes when you have a finding, it's all of those, mammogram, ultrasound, and MRI, to try to comb down on is this real and what is it likely to be. But the diagnosis is by a biopsy. That's the only way you're going to know. Can you breast cancer for men as well? Yes. So that slide on the right shows more birthdays have been celebrated because the death rate from breast cancer is going down, 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 down. Part of it is mammogram. Mammogram picks up 90%, and it picks it up 10 years before you're going to feel it. Some people will say, well, what about this kind of test or that kind of test? Every other uh, screening test out there doesn't do it. Okay, so this is a more contemporary star, and she's up here to... Right on. All right. Isn't that a good picture? <laughs> she is to remind me to talk about those hereditary syndromes. So um, 80, 90 percent of the breast cancer just come up. It's called autosomal dominant. So you have two, you get one that's messed up, you're going to get cancer. And then you could pass that on. So there's the dad with two genes and the mom with two genes. And if the mom passes, has a 50-50 chance, she passes it on to the kid then the kid has a 50-50 chance. And that's what Angelina Jolie had. She, her mom had a cancer, so she got tested, 
she had that BRCA1, that's what they are, BRCA1, BRCA2, she had that gene and she decided to have a double mastectomy to uh, decrease her risk. And was that a reasonable decision? Sure. She had a funny mammogram, she had a precancer. The precancer doesn't tend to go to cancer, but it does say she's at increased risk, plus she had the family thing. That little highlighted part shows the cervix at the bottom, and then it goes up kind of a little pear shape, up the pears the uterus and inside the uterus is the endometrium and then the ovaries are the little round things with the tubes. So <coughs> sorry it's not working. The original parts of the and they are cute. It was very, very hard to find any pictures or any celebrities or any well known people who have cervical cancer. I think the reason is the risk factors for cervical cancer are a little bit different than all the other cancers which we think are random or, you know, we feel really bad for people. But this one, people have a little bit of a different opinion about. So that person on the left is Eva Perone, mm -hmm. and she was diagnosed at 32 and died at 33. So <coughs> cancer. Mm -hmm. And on the right is this really fascinating book about a, a African-American woman who was treated for cancer, got a biopsy, and then they just took her her biopsy material and they started cloning it and it was the first ever cell line that did not. So it kept growing and growing. It's still growing to this day. There's enough of her cell line that we can go around the globe a few times. So she's immortal. She's dead, but her cell line is alive and it's a cancer cell line. But they have used that stuff to uh, diagnose genetic diseases and cancers and test drugs. It's amazing. And it's kind of amazing. But cervical cancer has decreased 50% as a result of screening. So this is like a real win story in sort of medical care. Some guy came up with a test that you could easily do in the office on uh, awake patients, and it would identify people who are at a pre-cancerous stage and give you plenty of warning to go and do something about it so they didn't get and the treatment was easy at the pre-cancer stage. So there was a big push in the last few decades to get people to go in and get their annual exams, which as long as you get that, you don't get cervical cancer. The only cervical cancers I've seen in 10 years, the last 10 years of my 20 years, are people who have been like five to seven years between getting checked. And they come in, you know, with a symptom and they have it. What is HPV? HPV is a human papilloma virus. And this is why I think it was hard to find famous people who came out and said, oh, I have cervical cancer, we need to like, talk about this and get this out in the public because it's a viral infection that's passed uh, between couples. In other words, it's an STD. There's about 100 HPV viruses identified. There's about 15 that are uh, significantly increase your risk of abnormal cells growing on your cervix that could become cancer. There is now there have been like five, eight years of vaccine against those big types. So in my own personal practice, I used to spend 50% of the time treating pre-cancer. Now, and I have this really nice expensive machine. I could have bought a car, but I bought that. <laughs> and I only use it like uh, 10 times, which is so sad. But good for you people, because it means we're like making way, way too much progress. Early detection leads to cure, vaccine prevents it. This is like what you want in all of medicine to find either the genetic thing and fix it before it starts or, or vaccinate against it or figure out what risk factors to avoid. And then at the last ditch effort, find it early. So like colonoscopy, find it early, get rid of it. Just to be redundant, uh, risk factors for cervical cancer, anything that increases your chances that you're going to get exposed to one of those 100 HPV viruses. So the earlier you start having sex, the more partners you have. And again, smoking. Has, has there been anything that showed up on this that didn't have smoking in there? No, it's not even. And then immune compromise. That's interesting. So most of your body is constantly making cancerous cells all day, every day. But your body is also wiping them out all day, every day. And it's when you start to lose the battle or the race that you actually will get the cancer. And so these insults, chemicals, toxins, bad food, laziness, immune compromise, which might be being tired, stressed, smoking, that is sort of helping you lose the battle. All right, so symptoms. So these are, say you're not one of those really good people who come in every year, and you're just like, oh, I'll never have to worry about that. That doesn't run in my family. One thing, it doesn't run in families. But 
if you're going to wait for a symptom uh, change in your bleeding or pain sometimes. That's it. Okay. So where are we going on this female body part? Huh? This is Robinson. <laughs> yes, this is Robinson. Uh, Anne Bancroft? Anne Bancroft. Yeah. Okay, and this is uh, the bottom right. This, like really famous Southern movie. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, the woman on the right, Evelyn something, and then she's the person who has this body part affection. And then the top right, friends with Annie Leibovitz, who took a number of these beautiful photos. Susan Sontag. So I uh, know she's not a rock star or movie star, but she is a sort of a legendary intellectual woman. So we started at the cervix and then we're going up to the top of the pair. Where are we? Then we this. This is the most common GYN cancer. So the GYN cancer, cervix, uterus, ovaries. Fortunately, it's the most common because it's the easiest one to deal with because it tends to have a warning sign. Uh, very curable, is found early, and you tend to find it early because most of the time people have a change in their bleeding. And change is any change. So when I have kids who come in the office, kids being 40, who used to have a five-day period, now they have a seven-day period, that's a change. In my mind, I'm going down the thought process of I have to make sure they don't have cancer. If they're, they have a change and they're only 35 and they are obese, same deal. Anybody who has any period after, or any bleeding after they quit out of any period, same deal. We have to check for this. Most commonly it happens in people who are over 50. And the other uh, associated risk factors are weight, diabetes, high blood pressure, infertility, unopposed estrogen. Maybe no progesterone? Yeah, you can get it from medications or, like some people they'll go to the store and take estrogen all by itself, a lot of it, oh. stuff like that. That's not necessarily the best idea. And there's some uh, hereditary syndromes that increase your risk. So, like I keep saying, unusual <coughs> bleeding or discharge, but uh, bleeding after menopause, pain or problems, urinating sometimes, pain with intercourse, a mass, weight loss. So, the nanny, Francis Drescher. Oh. So, the nanny. She's like the first person to get a lot of public notoriety around endometrial cancer. And then she, uh, maybe like five years after she was diagnosed, started an organization called Cancer Schmancer. So she's heroic. So you heard me your things like Yes. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, you were like a sharp red. Cora. No, red is Scott King. Yeah. She's something. She, so he got shot. And she'd been there side by side doing all this stuff, the civil rights and going to bat with everything. And he just stepped in and took it over. She didn't stop. She, she probably did more. And then the top right? Jessica Tandy. Yes. And then the person who really brought this one into the public eye on the bottom right. Gilda Rad, right? So I don't think people thought about ovaries till Gilda Rad. And so this is not very common, so most of us can't think of anybody, but when we do know somebody, it looks bad. It's usually, so the lifetime risk is a really low number compared to the rest, which is one in eight, this one's 73. Most of the time, you are not finding it till you're stage three or four, so usually we go one, two, three, four, one is easy. We always find endometrium at like one, and 90% cure rate, but we always, where it seemed like a lot of times we're finding ovaries at three or four, so it's like, 40 cents, not very good. And so that's why it's the highest number of female cancer death because we get it too late. We don't have a good screen. We don't have a colonoscopy. We don't have a pap smear. We don't have, you know, it's not present on our body like the skin is. We don't have x ray for the lung. It's, uh, it's hard to find it till it's too late. And the risk factors, so as you it's the same as with all the other ones. There's a, it goes up and up and up over time, and then it maybe dips down a little bit. It seems like if you live to be 80, you're like frozen. <laughs> uh, weight, reproductive history again, which has to do with 
how old you were when you started your period, did you interrupt your periods, like have pregnancy, or use birth control pills, and how old were you when you stopped that? Seems to affect things. Um, personal history, family history, and those hereditary symptoms. And the symptoms are so vague is why we don't find it very soon. But if you trauma face, when I find somebody with it, I can always dig back and find out, yeah, they did have something, but they didn't just think that much of it. They thought, oh, I'm just getting old, or oh, it's what I ate, or something. They kind of ignore something because it's a little bit subtle. So bloating, belly pain, swelling, and a lot of us, oh yeah, my legs are swelling, well, it's weather, or whatever. They, but they'll have something, and it'll last, you know, like I said in the beginning, it'll last more than a couple weeks, and it's different for you. It's worth not getting insomnia and freaking out, but it's worth thinking, maybe I should get an outside pain. Uh, changing your bladder function and sometimes bleeding. So that right hand side is to show that everything that happens with the ovaries isn't a cancer. Most of it isn't. In young people, you know, 99 percent of it isn't. In people over 50, probably two thirds, 70 percent isn't. But not in a malignant tumor, because your ovaries have all this other stuff they do all the time. They make cysts. That's its job is to put the egg out, and where the egg is coming out of is kind of a cyst type thing. That's the dilemma, is when we're looking at ovaries, a lot of normal stuff doesn't look that different from the bad stuff, and so you have to mm -hmm. fine tune how you look at it, you have to look at it over time, if the thing doesn't go away, then you get a little bit more excited, if it's bigger, you get more excited, if it's solid instead of fluid filled, you get more excited. Mm -hmm. That's hard. So, now we get to the good part, we're almost done. You and I are essentially infinite choice makers. In every moment of our existence, we are in that field of all possibilities where we have access to infinite choices. Some guy named Deepak. Mm -hmm. You may have picked up on the theme of the six S's. When I was 20 or something, right before I went to medical school, my dad used to write this um, newsletter at Thanksgiving to all the family, and he asked me to put a little article in there. So I put an article on the you know, five health tips, and it was five S's because I didn't have screening because I wasn't a doctor yet. But it was the same five when I was 20 years old. Seat belts, so big thing that causes, causes death in young people is car wrecks, sunscreen, no one needs to hear that again, right? Safe sex, for many reasons, uh, sensible weight. So that is one category to say, eating the right things, not eating too much of the certain things, having kind of a normal weight, or, yeah, we, and exercising. All of that goes into that, that particular S. Smoke, smoking cessation and screening. So see the doctor do those things. Do you know who this last star is? A hard one because you can't see her face. Okay, so here's your hint. She did it on heels and backwards and made him uh, look her uh, Yes, Ah, yes. <laughs> yes. So it was the girl on, on heels backwards and she made him look so good that no other dancer with him, wow. I mean, they just didn't ever look right. They didn't wow. feel right. I was the only person he wanted to dance with. Uh -huh. All right. There's Audrey again. Um, is there any age when people should not have pap smears or have them less frequently? So you can. Uh, have them less frequently if you've had a number of normals and you're with the same partner uh, and your test is negative. And they, they do two things. We do the PEP and we do the and actual HPV test, which is new. If, you're, if you meet all that and you're double negative, you can go five years. If you just have a negative PEP, you can go three. If you have no cervix, this is new, you don't even have to do it. If you have a hysterectomy, so no cervix left, and you had it for something besides cervical problems, you could quit, which is different than they used to say. Mm -hmm. The pap smear recommendations have evolved the most of anything because the test is getting better and better all the time. And uh, so the better the test is, the more you can trust it. So we really trust it now. Mm -hmm. And we usually don't start young, as we used to we used to start as soon as that girl walked in the room. Now we don't start till uh, after 20. And the reason is people, a lot of people have HPV and they get rid of it. So we don't really want to know if they have HPV because we don't want to overreact to it because they're going to cure it on their own. 
And um, so we start worrying about it more in the mid 20s and 30s. Yeah. What do you think about the three year uh, I'm like, I'm okay with it. I don't, I, what I have done in my practice, because I was on every year when I got here, is I slowly have advanced people at, you know, as I got to know them. You know, because part of it is a lot of people hadn't even been to the doctor in 10 years. So I'm like going to, you know, try to make the most of that person's visit if they're maybe not going to come back for a while. And um, I've had, you know, the anecdotal, I was going to quit, but I did one last one, and then that's the one where I found the thing. So I think it's on paper, it is okay, but I haven't really gone for the five year unless the patient wanted it. That double negative go five years, that's kind of, I'll have to grow into it. Thank you. I know two people who lived within an hour and a half of here who ended up with breast cancer because it was in the family. And they were both really smart and did a lot of screening. And so it's like, pass the word, be careful if you have, you know, your mother, your sister, your aunt, or somebody. Yeah, so most of those, even with the family, it's still sporadic. But that hereditary breast, ovarian cancer thing, that, they have the that BRCA, so the tip-off is a male in your family, uh, somebody who's, for all the genetic things, so there's a, you know, somebody in town whose son, under 20, had a colon cancer. That's a tip-off to do the genetic testing. Uh, bilateral, so you have eye cancer, both eyes, both breast, both kidneys. You have both sides affected, that's a tip-off to do the test. So two young, or the wrong gender. So you have, did I already say this, man in the family has breast cancer? So the wrong gender has it bilateral, younger than you'd expect. And what I usually ask in the office is primary relatives, so mother, sister, daughter. Uh, and you, you should, I probably should ask if the father's had prostate because it kind of connected. And so the people with that H block is what we call it, hereditary breast or cancer. They're at risk for a whole bunch, thyroid, pancreas, colon, a whole bunch of things, not just breast and ovary, but if we find those people, we offer to take out their ovaries if they're young, if they're working, because that will decrease your risk of breast and almost eliminate ovarian, and we uh, offer either increased surveillance or mastectomy, because their chances are so high. Very good question. Um, if the males in the family, if a few of them have had prostate cancer or problems, can that cause a genetic influence on the females in the family? It's, uh, it's like a sign it might be, it, especially mm -hmm. if they're young, that because the longer they live, like if you live to be 115, you're going to get breast cancer. You're going to get something. The same for you. You're going to get prostate cancer. So if they're kind of older, I don't necessarily think of that, but say they're 50 <coughs> yeah, or I'm, 60, I'm, I'm, that um, might make you think of it. I had a relative die in his 50s, and the uh, father had issues as well. Yeah, so, so it makes you think of getting a genetic uh, consult. Mm -hmm. Because they ask a more thorough uh, screening, and then there's really specific tests. There's not just one test, there's like so many things. Right. Where do we get genetic consults? Um, could you talk about the resources in our community? Or? They're not here. I think we have to at least get to Santa Rosa. Mm -hmm. John, you're probably the city. Mm -hmm. We've got a few people that uh, have gone to each direction, depending. Mm -hmm. So I'm a regular GYN doctor. I don't even take. I don't take care of actually the cancer. There's GYN cancer specialists and non-GYN cancer cancer specialists. They're the ones who actually take care of people with cancer. I just like help you find it, help you avoid it, get you there, take care of you afterward. So um, usually that first person is how you get the genetic test, but like if you were interested, then we would have to find somebody. Did you have a question? Yeah. You mentioned fats. Um, fats. In diet? Yeah, in diet, and I'm Does curious. What, taste good? I'm curious what you mean. You know, if you could say a little more about that. What so types of fats are overall the? Um, it's not. It's 
the kind of fat. So you know, there's the. Um, it's not animal fat and but and non-animal fat. It's the uh, trans. monounsaturated trans yeah. stuff. So why? I never want to tell somebody they should be vegan or they should be vegetarian or they should be paleo or whatever. It's kind of, there's too many variables, but what it seems like most of the good science, um, protein and animal fat isn't necessarily bad, but how you prepare it, so the really yummy barbecue, all that charcoal is maybe not that great. Mm -hmm. um, butter's fine, margarine's not that great. Uh, full fat milk is okay, um, just not that much of it maybe. There's stuff they're putting in it that's actually a problem, like cottage cheese has this stuff called carrageenan in it, maybe that's not that great. But almost everybody says lots of vegetables and uh, plenty of fruit, the whole stuff, not the juice, uh, honey, not sugar. They're saying agave is kind of bogus too, believe it or not. Stuff we always think is great, like soy. Everybody says, oh, soy is bomb. Soy is grown in the Midwest, I shouldn't say to us. This is what, this is my, I'm going to editorial now. I think it's the GMO that's the problem um, more than the food. Soy has a lot of problems. Pardon? Soy has a lot of problems too. Yeah, soy, corn, wheat, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I um, was just reading an article from an old Consumer Report a few days ago that talked about so much of the gluten-free products are made with rice flour, as we know, yes. and the arsenic in rice is really at very serious levels, uh, to the point where children should not be given rice cereals and things like that. Do you have any? I I believe it. Formaldehyde and arsenic are in a lot of things that they wow. create bleached and processed. So uh, at my house, we don't have very much of that. We have sweet potatoes and yams and lots of vegetables. I need not to just give me a delivery. But um, yeah, does that answer your question, kind of? Well, in men, um, how prevalent is breast cancer in men? And so um, what treatment, what, what, uh, what uh, uh, you get, the, you get the same thing. Well, see, that's the problem. You're not going to get a mammogram. Right. Not so until you have one. Well, you would know. Okay. Yeah, and then you have mastectomy. Mm -hmm. There's somebody super who had a uh, cancer. Yeah. 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 Somebody. Uh, yeah. It's her. But, yeah, but it's not very common. Because breast cancer is prevalent on the men on the women's side. It's very prevalent. So. So. They should maybe get genetic testing. And then you have a 50 50 chance. Oh. But you're kind of old, so you probably already have it. Oh, 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 wow! <laughs> 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 it's, I think that it's the uh, genetic things you get people kind of younger. Yeah, okay. What I'm saying. We'll <laughs> edit that out of the video. <laughs> <laughs> Do you help women in your practice who have had hysterectomies and are dealing with um, the sudden onset of menopause? Yes, I do have that quite often. But if, what's interesting is, even if you take out their ovaries because you're trying to protect them from breast cancer or ovarian cancer, you can give them estrogen back because the amount of estrogen your body's putting into your system is like 10 to 40 times what that little bit of estrogen is. And the, the data does not seem to increase your risk which is miraculous. So of course, the estrogen you're putting in your system is going to cause ovarian cancer because they're gone and it's not related. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem like it's increasing the breast cancer risk. The unfortunate thing is most people are so, so worried about breast cancer because it's kind of common that they don't want to take any chance even though the fact is they're probably cured and not really taking an increased risk. I'm going to ask you a question about um, hormone replacement therapy and then the for postmenopausal. What's your belief your opinions about that? Uh, individual, but I'm not against it at all. People have to live and live well, and there's people who never need it whatsoever. They have no symptoms, and I have no urge to give them that. And then there's people who are 80 and they're still on it, and they are not the same without it. And who am I? Once you're on it, can you get off it? Yeah, probably half of the people, two thirds. What are you thinking about? Um bone health, osteoporosis and bone health, and what people who are postmenopausal should be doing about that. 
So um, the, the main thing about osteoporosis is fracture. So number one, don't fall. <laughs> that's the big thing. Seriously, yeah, it sounds silly, but the biggest thing you could do is maintain a good weight and continue to be active so that you continue to have good balance. And there's Tai Chi and Pilates and yoga are really, really brilliant for helping. All your senses go over time. Your ears, your eyes, your taste buds, and your balance is one of them. And it, it goes. I mean, Odessa could tell you that people start walking a little wider because we're not that great with our balance after a while, right? It's all drinking. <laughs> but um, so number one, don't fall. And the way to do to work on that is stay active and watch your weight. Don't say all stuff. But um, so now we have evidence that the medicines that we like to give you, we maybe just can't give you forever. So some people don't want to be on hormones forever, can't. And other people don't want to be on bone building drugs forever, and shouldn't be because they start to not work that great. So the the logic is. Uh, if you're going to be on hormones, go on them and stay on them until you feel like you can't be on them anymore. And then there's going to be a little gap. Once you go off of them, your bones are going to start to get thinner. Mm -hmm. And then there's a time when you might consider going on a bone agent. And you want to get on that if you're going to want it, when it's going to be really relevant. So when your bones are kind of bad and your risk of falling is high enough that the risk is higher than uh, the risk of the drug. And so they do all these fancy calculations. And so what we used to start screening for bone uh, osteopenia, osteoporosis, like as soon as you hit menopause, see where your bone were to start with. Now we kind of don't do that anymore. I don't mind. If somebody wants it, I'll do it. It's easy. But we really want to check like 70, 75, because that's when you're going to fall down. And any thoughts about supplements or, I mean, vitamin D, calcium, magnesium? Yes. Do you all recommend? That. Vi yeah, I think. I mean, some people don't think that's right. I, I think vitamin D is brilliant in a million ways. And the more studies that come out, the more I see that. And calcium and vitamin D are building blocks for the bones. So if you don't have the building blocks, unless you have a medical reason where you shouldn't take too much, like a thyroid, parathyroid, or some other kind of kidney thing where you're doing something funny with your calcium, I think most people can be on calcium. And Do you have a recommendation about how much? Because it seemed like the recommendation was bigger, and then a few years ago it sort of sort of got ratcheted down. Yeah, I don't. I haven't. I I know that's out there, mm -hmm. and it has to do with the stone. And I think that's like mm -hmm. overreacting. People overreact so much to stuff. Mm -hmm. But I know that there's doctors out in town that are they're kind of confusing. They say, you know, you probably shouldn't take that much calcium, but then you don't say, well, why not? And what would I take? So I still say the same thing. If you're menopausal and you're not on hormones, it's 500 three times a day because your body can only absorb so much. And you know, if you're taking hormones, it could be less. If you get a lot of calcium in your diet, it could be less. But it, you know, that's kind of the starting place. And the D depends on your D level if your doctor gets a D level, and it's somewhere between a thousand and four for most people a day. And then K2. Vitamin K290 milligrams, I think, is to help put things where they belong in the bone. That's the, the latest that I hear. The whole uh, nutrition and supplements, huge topic that it's hard to keep up with. And magnesium, I think magnesium. And omega 3. Yeah, 3 is good. It's best to get everything in your diet if you can. There's a few things I think are impossible. If you need iron, probably have to take it. If you need D, you probably have to take it. Vitamin B12, I will say, probably just take that. 1,200 a day. Kind of good for your sleep, kind of good for your muscles, your nervous system, good for your brain. And uh, the, somewhere later this year, you're going to have a talk about Alzheimer's. And hopefully they'll agree that the B12 is. Uh, preventive or helpful with Alzheimer's, which that's a, the topic I'm the most stressed out about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it is time. 6:30. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much.